and thank you for joining us today at Thomson Reuters Talks Financial Crime. I'm your host, Gina Jerva, attorney and manager of market insights and thought leadership here at the Thomson Reuters Institute. We are continuing with the story surrounding the U.S. Department's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, or the so-called FinCEN file leaks. Now, as many of you know, over 2,000 files known as Suspicious Activity Reports, or SARS, were leaked to the press back in September of this year. Now, SARS are highly confidential reports that financial institutions send to law enforcement when they believe suspicious activity has occurred within their financial institution. It is then law enforcement's job to review those reports and decide whether to investigate and then send off for a prosecution. In previous episodes, we talked with my two colleagues, Nathan Lynch and Brett Wolf from Thomson Reuters Regulatory Intelligence. And we really talked about the global perspective of the FinCEN file leaks and what that meant for the world. Today, joining me, and I'm very honored to have Michael Messier. Now, Michael has an extensive law enforcement background. He is a former senior US law enforcement supervisory special agent. He spent nearly three decades in both the public and the private sides of the anti-money laundering profession. For 15 years, he was a special agent with the U.S. Department, U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, including diplomatic postings at the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City. And then in 2010, he joined the financial institution space at Bank of America and led its financial crimes compliance operation in Latin America. Michael left Bank of America in 2015, and he now um, runs a private consulting practice called Global Compliance and Strategic Solutions, LLC. Michael, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, thank you for having me, Gina, and happy to be here. Well, this is an exciting conversation to have for sure. Um, You know, and I think there's been a lot of talk about the FinCEN leaks. There's been a lot written about it. I'd like to get, you know, your perspective, having that the both the public and the private side, you know, what what have the leaks highlighted about the effectiveness of or ineffectiveness of the international anti-money laundering regimes? Can you kind of set the stage for us? Sure. And uh, and I do want to set the stage, Gina, on that. It's a great question. Um, We have to look at both sectors, the public sector and the private sector. When we're talking about the framework, a lot of times when the framework is discussed, it goes people talk one or the other. But let's look at the public and the private. In the private sector, we have law enforcement and regulators. The law enforcement is the operational side. They're the ones that are doing the investigations. We're all familiar with the investigations that are done by law enforcement. And they do that by um, investigative techniques and in, in, in gathering evidence to build the case for prosecution. On the private side, we have the financial institutions. And that's where we have uh, basically the entities that are on the forefront. They are opening up accounts. They need to know their customer. They have an onboarding process that helps them identify who their customer is, um, source of funds, um, what exactly the needs are of the customer, but not only on the onboarding side at the initial phase of the customer relationship, but during the uh, life of the relationship of the customer, they they look at the refresh. They will revisit this this customer one, two, or every three years, depending on the risk ranking. And they will look at to see if this customer is, still who they say they are. Sure. Um, and then you also look at the monitoring, which is what we're talking about today. The monitoring of the, the ongoing monitoring of the account transactions. And that's where the um, financial institutions will file SARs or suspicious activity reports with their respective financial intel- intelligence unit in their entity. And as a footnote, when I say SARs, I'm talking collectively to include suspicious transaction reports. So um, uh, other jurisdictions will call them STRs, but it's, it's one and the same, basically. And what these leaks highlighted was basically gaps in cracks in the foundation, if, if you will, of the uh, global AML CFT framework. Right. And I I think some of the articles we've seen, some of the reporting on this, they seem to suggest that financial institutions are really responsible in some way, that they maybe weren't doing their job, that that they they should be doing more to prevent 
and stop financial crimes such as money laundering, terrorist financing, et cetera. And that really puts them in you know, somewhat of a precarious position um, in the role of acting as quasi law enforcement. But just to be clear, and I'd love to hear your perspective on that. I mean, that is not what banks are. They are not quasi law enforcement. So what do you think about this? I mean, isn't law enforcement really in charge of the investigation and then that banks are filing SARS as they are supposed to? No, Gina, you're absolutely right. Um, the sole responsibility of investigating and, and arresting individuals is with law enforcement, obviously. Banks are doing what they're supposed to do, what they're required to do by law and by regulatory requirements. Um, and that is they set up adequate and effective AML programs. Financial institutions basically are managing and mitigating risk. They're not it's impossible to eliminate. If you want to eliminate risk in a financial institution, you shut the doors, there's no risk. But right. is that really, you know, is that, are we achieving anything there? Um, so the question now becomes, what does law enforcement do with these SARS? Um, quite, quite frankly, the law enforcement uses SARS as investigative direction only. Um, SARS cannot, they're not evidence uh, they can't be put in any court documents. They can't be included in any reports. They basically give law enforcement the direction to see where they can go from a um, from an investigative direction. Now, for example, let's say I am doing a predicate crime or a specified unlawful activity, um, investigating one uh, on drug trafficking. I will be, or well, my group, my team would be investigating this organization, identifying buys and sells and, and their source of supply, and you're seeing that they're building this case on the predicate side. Now the question is, what do they do with the money? And that's where um, for the financial institutions interface with law enforcement. That's when law enforcement queries the database that's held at their respective FIU to see if there's any tie to or if they can develop an investigation, uh, a financial investigation that's tied to their predicate crime. So let's say, for example, I'm, I'm targeting Gina and, and Gina and her nefarious group of individuals trafficking drugs. Once we've worked that predicate crime side, or well, sometimes we do it in conjunction, but nonetheless, we will query FinCEN and we will see what's, if SARS were filed. And if there are SARS on record, depending on the length, the age of the size, we will perhaps file a, uh, or submit a, a, a grand jury subpoena to the bank. And then the bank will then provide us the documentation and we will now be set in that direction um, on the financial investigation. Um, and that's basically it. Yeah, and it's just, it's, you know, the law enforcement is building a case against a potential defendant. They're using SARS to help and aid in that investigation to help lead you to evidence that will be admissible in court later is, is the idea. I, and and yeah. going and, and looking at the SARS database and then subpoenaing those records, as you mentioned, is exactly the way it's done. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, it's not just the SAR either. That's just an sure. investigative direction. Now, once you've identified some other players, you use your investigative techniques um, to expand that side of the investigation. And, and quite frankly, when you expand the financial side of an investigation, you bring in more co-conspirators. Right. You bring in more targets. Um, to give you an example, if there's any undercover activity going on where you're, you're let's just, I'm going to use drugs just for the sake, it's a simple thing to say. Um, you, you're buying drugs in an undercover operation, there's a, and you're using an informant, let's right. say, uh, or an undercover agent, now you can turn, once you get more information, now you can turn the, the, the focus from the, the predicate crime, the drugs, to the financial, and you can get more and more evidence that way. So the SARS is simply an investigative um, avenue, uh, excuse me, an investigative direction tool yep. where you can employ the other um, investigative techniques to expand your current investigation. So, Michael, I think in, in wrapping this up, you know, if you could tell us just like what lessons can financial institutions really take away from the FinCEN files leaks? And, you know, specifically, if you could touch upon also the importance of that public private partnership in working together in information sharing. Sure. Well, we're, we're limited on our time, so I'll just 
look at an overview uh, and how to respond to that. And I think what we have, what the financial institutions need to do um, is basically look at every deposit, withdrawal, wire transfer, every transaction that's going on that they could deem suspicious and tied to a, uh, a nefarious criminal organization. And they have to realize that behind those transactions is human suffering, is tragedy, possibly even loss of life due to the predicate crime, be it drug trafficking, um, human trafficking, what have you. And we have to remember that white collar crime, that white collar is stained by the blood of the victims of those predicate crimes. And with regards to law enforcement, because we talked before public and private sector, um, law enforcement has to step up and law enforcement needs to partner closely with banks and financial institutions. They both have a tremendous amount of information, intelligence um, on money laundering activities or potential money laundering activities, terrorist financing. They, and at times they act or they operate in, sec uh, in silos. Sure. We need to bring the public and private sectors together um, and sharing their resources, um, making their efforts more efficient and more effective in combating all financial crimes. It's important information. Thank you so much. And a really, really great reminder that there is a human element to all of this that we are talking about today. So Michael Messi, I really appreciate your time today and bringing your experience and, and uh, your background to this conversation. Really, really important. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.